Donc la série « We are ready ». So, who is coming first? Pastor is coming to greet us first, then he'll handle water mission. Welcome. God bless you all. It's good to have you all. There's nothing like being in person when the word is being dispensed. There's something you catch that you can't catch online. So God bless those of you who are here tonight. And tonight is Missions Thursday, so I'm going to turn over to our missions director, and he will direct us. God bless. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord another time. Amen. Let me greet first, Pastor. God bless you, sir. Thank you as well, Sister Jackie, for opening today's service. And everybody just lift your hands and thank you, Lord. We're living in a troubled world, but thank the Lord that we are in the right place. We are in the right mind. Amen. And can observe these things and think it's not normal. <laughs> Amen. And God is good. Amen. Amen. We're going to be starting today's service with a little missions update. And then ask the media team just to play that first slide or slides. And then perhaps we'll play it later on as well since there are not many persons here as yet. Which is just to give an update on the work of missions. And of course, that picture was taken when we are in the Castleites community, and you can see in their hands, Bibles. <laughs> Amen? The children were so happy to receive their Bibles. Amen? Not that one yet. Amen. Yes. Yes, you can go on to the just gonna look at the data on this from January twenty twenty four to March. Okay, seems that they're having a little problem upstairs. All right, so let me just give you the figures, and then perhaps later on when we sort out what's happening upstairs. So our first quarter, Mission Sunday attendance, uh, which is from January to March. Of course, every first Sunday, we have um, Mission Sunday. So from in January, first Sunday in January, we had 339 persons in attendance at our services. And in February, February 4, that number went up to 353. And then on March 3, 2024, 390. So, so far, the trajectory looks encouraging in that it's an upward trajectory. Amen? In terms of guests, first time guests, in January we had 21. In February, 15. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we did that slide already. You can look at it first quarter mission Sunday, January 339, February 353, and 390. So we encourage persons to bring out the, your guests, amen? And of course, we started last month with our greet, meet and greet session with our, with our guests at the um, conference room where we give them a little token, a little refreshment, and as well, we ask our leaders and ministry leaders to be present to greet our guests and just to find out a little bit more about them and to basically make them feel at home. 
Amen? So that they'll be encouraged to return. And of course, that takes place right after we have the formal closing of service with the benediction. Right, the next slide. Okay. So our target for 2024 is 400 each mission Sunday. Right? Yes, so we're not far from that. In fact, we should target seem a little bit low now. Perhaps we should go to 450. If everyone brings out a guess, of course, that's easy to achieve. All right? All right, the next slide. Okay, the first quarter attendance, we did that one already. Um, you can go back to that slide. The first quarter guest attendance. The one before that. In January 21. In February 15. And March, we had 29 first time guests. And our target, of course, is really for seven each mission Sunday or seven every Sunday, at least we should have 28 at least each month. Amen? In terms of our first quarter of baptism, January 2024, we had four persons being baptized. In February 7, and in March 9, that is showing an upward trajectory. The target is for four each month, which seems too minimal. In terms of the first quarter, fill, persons filled with the Holy Ghost. In January, we had one person. In February, five. And in March, one. So let us continue in our missions, labor, plant a seed. Of course, we feed it, we water it, and God will give us the increase. Amen? Amen? Amen. Any questions on this before we move on? Anybody want any clarity on anything in terms of the data? All right. So remember, each one brings one. Amen. So at this time, we're going to be starting our study. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. So let me see the hands of those who have had a guest from January to now coming in church. Say so one, two, three. Okay, four, five. Very good. Very good. All right, so I'm going to be inviting Sister Blankson, who will be teaching today's study. God bless her. Bless the Lord. Just give him 
Hallelujah. Praise and worship. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, mighty and everlasting God. Just asking you, that even as you worship God, you just give a little prayer. Just pray, pray for the messenger. Pray that the Lord will continue to have his hand on the messenger. Pray for the message. Pray for the message that it is indeed God-centered. Hallelujah. Pray for the teaching. Pray for the teaching that it will be Holy Ghost empowered. Glory. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ. Bless your name, almighty God. Give you praise and thanks for all things that are done in your name. For a new day. For life. The opportunity to worship and serve you and to praise your name and to do your work, God. We lift up your name. Do you come in your presence, God? Let me first greet the pastor and also his wife. May they be blessed always for the work that they have been doing. I thank all of you who are here. May God bless you also for coming out once more. Pray for the others who are on their way that they'll meet their way here shortly. Thank you all and bless you. So the Bible study that we are doing this evening is based on the missions department and their work. That's what we are looking at this evening. <clears throat> First, the question should be asked, what is missions? So missions is all about the work that is done in the missions department. And the missions department is the arm of the church that is tasked with the responsibility to evangelize the community, to evangelize the world. The purpose of missions is given to us in the scriptures. We'll look at a few of them shortly. And it is still relevant today, not just then, but also today. Missions is about reaching out to unsaved souls, preaching the word in the hearing of all persons, assisting in the process of establishing faith in unbelievers. This is what, what was done in the early times. In the Bible, we see that, and it continues to today. Where we ask, go in to the communities and everywhere, asking persons to repent of their sins and give their life to Christ. The missions department member of the committee, that's the UPCI International, says, the world around us needs Jesus. The missions committee should develop strategies to share the gospel in their community and by extension to the world. By casting a vision for missions, all are allowed to grasp the church mission focus and to discover how they can fulfill that purpose, that goal. Whatever the, the, the mission is, you will help to achieve it once you have understood it, once it is known unto you. And therefore, I now give the mission statement for Pentecostal Sanctuary. The mission statement is to go into our communities converting souls and developing them into effective witnesses to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is for us to go into the communities around us. What are those communities? Where are those communities? So the communities, the church have communities that they have been working with extensively. So we know those communities. And those are the communities in which we can evangelize. But there are other communities that we can evangelize in. One of the first communities that we have is in the family. So we can look in our family to see where we can evangelize. Our relatives. Sometimes a little bit more difficult, but we can start there. Other communities are the one in which we live. And we may be living somewhere, well, probably we were not always living there. We were not born there. So there are other communities that you can go to. 
If you are, for example, residing in Dwayne Park, no. But early times you were living in Papine, then there is a community there in Papine that you can also go to. So there are communities that we have to go to and evangelize. The congregation is there charged to move out in the surrounding church communities, in the workplaces, at schools, among your relatives, and spread the word of the gospel and the need for repentance, the need for water and Holy Ghost baptism for salvation. That basically is what evangelism is about. Reaching lost of soul, let them know about the gospel message and the need for salvation. This is a mandate given in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19. But there are others that you can look at in Mark 16, 15, for example, where it is given. And Acts 1, 8, those are some of the scriptures that are given for you to evangelize. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That is what is required of us. But are we acting upon this assignment? Are we actively acting upon this assignment? What is preventing some of us from carrying out this mandate? It could be fear. But what does the Bible say? That he gives you not the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, of a sound mind. Fear not. It could be of shame. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Apostle Paul says, I'm not sure. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is a power of God unto salvation. You don't have to be ashamed. And there are many persons who are ashamed. And for that reason, these days, I try to carry around the Bible with me in my hand so that even my students will know that there is no shame to carry around a Bible. It shouldn't be a shame. Could it be a lack of confidence? Is it you don't have the knowledge? Is it that you think that you really don't matter? There are others who can do it. Even that confidence you don't have. Hmm? If you don't have the knowledge, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Once you come in the presence of God, there is some knowledge. Hmm? There was a young maid, and she was in the house of Naaman. She saw what was happening to this man who was supposed to be mighty next to the king of Syria. He was the king's top man, especially at a time when they were victorious in some of their battles. But he was sick. He was a leopard. And she, knowing that, she just whispered something. Just said something to the mistress. That if he could only see the man of God that is in Israel. It must have been profound. Because it was done to the hearing of Naaman's wife, but it reached to the king of Syria where he was able to give something in writing for Naaman to go to the king of Israel for healing to take place. Huh? And he followed through. Hmm. So much so that he was healed. Naaman was healed eventually after he was obedient. And then what did he say? There is no God in anywhere else but in Israel. Just that one incident. A little thing that she said, don't be afraid. Reach out to person at your level if you think that you don't have the full knowledge of the scripture to bring to their attention. Just reach out to someone at your level. Probably can start even with your son, your daughter, your nieces, or nephew. Until you build that confidence. 
God will take you through. He will see your heart. And as you go through and as you make mis mistakes, that will help you to grow and to know more, to prepare yourself more. Sometimes we say we're busy and we procrastinate also. But I tell you, I know what it is. Right now my schedule is so packed that it, it, when you look at it, there's really no space in my schedule. Someone was trying to reach me several times that I could not because I kind of have to put the phones away. Last night I retired pretty late trying to complete the task. So I know, I know what it is like. But then you still have to remember God and his business. He, you have to remember God. There are times when you have to say, let the dead bury their dead. Let them deal with their problems so I can deal with God's. Sometimes we just have to go there to be able to do the work of God. Sometimes it is respect for others and their decisions and their privacy, whatever they're doing. Hmm? If you're an intelligent person, you're supposed to understand when you approach someone and they say, I have a church already, I have a religion already, I don't believe in God, you're supposed to leave it at that. This is the one that really I struggle sometimes to pass because I kind of, you know, have respect for a person and their decision and so forth. But I can't leave it at that. There is something more. Hmm? that I have to do than to show respect for them. And therefore, if a person who are struggling with this, you can start by just asking the person if we can share. They like, they prefer that word. But can we share our thoughts on God and religion? Probably you can start there. Probably you can look for the ideal opportunity to plug in a word. Sometimes it is how it starts. But we still have to share. We cannot make that be a valid excuse. Sometimes it's unbelief. We do not believe much of what we are doing or saying. If we believe that salvation is through Jesus Christ only, then we will take our task more seriously. If we believe that there is no other name given to man under the heaven whereby men must be saved, then we probably will work a little bit more aggressively to evangelize, to speak with others. Glory be unto God. So those are just some of the excuses that we may give from time to time. The truth of the matter is, what is really preventing us from carrying out this mandate is a lack of burden. So all of these reasons that we have given is because that burden that we have for souls is not prioritized, is not the first and foremost. Someone says that once you're a Christian, really, the next thing is about winning souls. The, the person, the cyclist goes on his bike, sets himself on his bike, and he secures himself. And then he asks Pelion to come on to carry him safely. If you are in the plane and it goes through some turbulence. You're asked to put on your oxygen mask first and then you help that person who depends on you, a child or probably a senior citizen. If you are buckled down, if you are in Christ and you have given your life to him, the next thing is to attend to someone. Start saving them. You put on your oxygen mask already, man, to save yourself. Save someone else's life now. That is what is required of us. 
who are Christians. If we only can save ourselves and stay in the church, the investment that is made in the church really is not worth it. The investment that is made is for others to come in, to make room for others, for growth to take place. That's what it's supposed to be. The pastor did say something that would validate just what I said. It's about having sinners coming in. We cannot just be preaching to ourselves daily. The pastor has a responsibility to keep the sheep, yes. But we have to take in others to hear the word of God. So we have to examine ourselves. If, we, if that burden is great enough, if it is great enough. Matthew 9, 35 it says, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Matthew 9, 36 says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion and on them because they fainted. And were scattered abroad. And sheep, as sheep having no shepherd. Scattered abroad? Where were the people? They were right there in front of Jesus. So how could he say that they are scattered abroad? So there is something different than what he was looking at at first. So he was preaching the gospel and attending to their illnesses and their diseases. But here... He moved with compassion, but it wasn't really for the sickness and the diseases. Those were the symptoms that were manifested. There is something, a problem, a fundamental problem that he saw, and that is what he was moved to compassion about. He had a burden. He had a burden. Isaiah 1. If we look in Isaiah 1 verse 2, we see where it says, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The children who I have nourished, the children who I have brought up, they have rebelled against me. He says, the ox knoweth their owner, and the ass is master's crib. But Israel doth not know my people. They do not consider. The dumb animals, they know who their owner is. They identify with their owner. The ass, he knows his master's crib, where he should go. But the people, they do not know. Those people who he nurtured and who he cared for wandered from God. And therefore, if we read further, in that same chapter, he tells what happened when they moved from his presence. It shows that their head is sick. Their heart is faint. That's what he tells in the scripture before, you know. What it says in Matthew 9, verse 36. It says that he, saw, he moved with compassion. He saw where they faint. And that is what happened when they moved from the presence of God. That is what Jesus was saying. Jesus had a burden for the people. He was moved with compassion. We're supposed to have that same kind of a burden. Reaching out for souls. Feeling their pain. Calling them into the house of God. God had done, he did everything for them. He did everything for them and when he realized it didn't work, he says, come, let us reason. I did all of that for you. What more could I have done? 
You have drifted. You have moved from the master. The Apostle Paul shows what happens to the lost sheep. For the uncircumcised, for those who probably are referred to as Gentiles. He tried to characterize their state. He says that, that they are without Christ. They are alien to the commonwealth of Israel, God's chosen and blessed people. He says that they are strangers to the covenants of promise. They are without hope, without God. They are living in hopelessness. That's what happened. That's the state they are in. Let me kind of personalize it a bit. So if I have my relatives and they have not given their life to Christ, it means that they their last state will be in hell. Hmm? That's their last state. That's a serious state. It is so serious that God tells us that we shouldn't fear he who can kill the body, but not the soul. We must rather fear him who will destroy the body and the soul, even in hell. We are supposed to move but sometimes, brethren, I have it in my house, do you know? When I see my sons, when I consider their state, their present state, recognize that if they don't give their life to Christ, what will happen? It, I'm really moved to tears. And sometimes I have to preach the gospel pastor right there in the house. Sometimes I have to do that. It's incumbent on us to make sure that we spread the word of God. Not only do we want them to be in the kingdom of heaven. That's what we want, yes. But do we realize that if we don't do our work, it comes back to haunt us? Sister Jackie, what did she just say? What is happening in the schools what is happening, I don't know, on social media? There was a time when many of us, the younger ones probably would not know this, but there was a time when many of us could sleep with our doors unlocked. So we just kind of push up the door. When my son gets home from work, he can get in. I don't have to lock it. What's happening to us now? So we started with burglar bars. The work that the Christians were doing. They need more laborers. Couldn't reach everyone. People were getting more vile, so they had to put on burglar bars. And then we recognized that that wasn't sufficient. So we put on security monitors and cameras. We started with a more passive one. We, we you know, somebody come in our territory, the light comes on. But we wanted to do more. So we put something out to give us a ring or a camera. We can see who it is. There was a time when you go into the mall and you just move in, drive and park and go where you want to go. Most places you see security guards. When you go into the universities, universities, you have to go through with a chit. And the security gives you, and there's a security all around. What a change to the landscape. Hmm? Guardsmen who carry around the money, and they're supposed to be the protecting agent and guard the money to take it to where it's supposed to be going. But they're under attack. They can't secure the funds anymore. They need a security to secure the security. No. You see where they are going? When we fail, more of these come back to haunt us. 
So we are doing this work for ourselves also, as well for the kingdom of God. Praise the name of the living God, Jesus. Glory be unto God. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus has his burden. Jesus has his burden. When he recognized all of what is happening, Jesus said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Oh my. So many of us here can identify with that. The laborers are few. He asked us to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers. But Proceeding that, ver that chapter in Matthew 9 is Matthew 10. After Jesus was moved to compassion, then he calls his disciples and he sent them out. He gave them power over unclean spirits, over sicknesses and diseases, and he sent them out. But when he sent them out, the first thing he said for them to do was to preach that the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's what we are supposed to be doing. Prioritizing God's work at all times. Brethren, it's difficult sometimes to find a time. But I urge us all never to relent, but to continue to find a little time to reach out to someone. Utilize all the resources that are there, availed to us. I'm not really a social media person. I don't want to be, I don't even know how Facebook and others work because I realize the addictive nature of it. But if you are on those platforms, the least you can do is use it for the kingdom of God. I beseech thee to do this for Christ. So Christ sent out his disciples. My question is... Who are the laborers here? The church? Who is the laborer in our midst? It's all of us. It's all of us. We are the bride of Christ. We are supposed to be carrying out God's mandate. We are supposed to be doing the work of God. That is what we are supposed to be doing. He leaves us in charge to take, out, take control of those works and those things. It says in John 4, 31, Jesus, it shows there that Jesus prioritized the work of God. When others, the disciples came back with food and urged him to eat, he said he had meat. They were baffled. Where did he get food from? But his meat is to follow the will of God. That was his work, to put it first. He did demonstrate that so beautifully, how we should live. I'm going to come back each time I say something like this, to say something to each of every one of us, including myself. Don't think that I am exempt. All of us here should take this seriously. We have a lot of work at the workplace. And no matter how much you work, it's not going to get done. You're still going to have some left behind. I have pulled myself from a number of functions and higher posts to do my work. I oh, forgot. Find some time. They still find me, you know. I don't have the position. I take my way from it, but I still find you. So I know what you are going through. But again, I'm saying that we still have to find some time to see if we can do this work for Christ because we see what is happening around us. My vow and part of my New Year resolution was to do, to get some persons in the church for Christ to be a soul winner. I put myself for six persons. Can you imagine? Just six. At least. I didn't say six, but at least six. 
But recognizing what it takes and the time and everything, I say six to start with. For a long time, I really didn't put a quote on myself. I just did God's work. But I put a quote on myself because... I want to do some kind of self-evaluation and see how successful I'm on and, and so on. Not bad so far, but it's very hard. So far, uh, two persons and two persons um, I'm engaging in Bible study still. Lots of persons I've invited. So we're not talking, you know, you can invite, you can take them out to church because we also have a target that we're working with, with the mission director just outlined. 400 persons on a mission Sunday. Hmm? That's the minimum we want to have. And he gives individual, individual how many we should be carrying out. So we're working towards that. But in terms of how many persons I want to ensure that comes in the house of God to give their life to Christ, I'll just put a minimum of six. Because how it is it takes a lot of effort to do that and to do all the other things that you're doing. And therefore, if, he, if I feel if I can get six in, it's, it's not so bad. Huh? Realize this. That when God is looking at your work, he's not going to be looking so much that I made only six. And he made 12. And that one is better than I am. He's looking at the opportunity that were presented to you. And that you did not capitalize on. That is what he's looking at. If you are a stewardess and you work on the ground, your life on the ground, you probably have a few days, then you probably won't be able to come to church every day and to go out in the community and evangelize every day. Probably you won't be able to. So you probably can only win two persons for the year to get them in the church of God. And God will honor that. And there's another person who probably get 20. And God is saying that he just didn't do enough. The opportunities were presented to him to get more. Let us look at ourselves and see what we are doing and how much more we can do. The idea is to ensure that you are doing as much as you can for Christ. Glory be unto God. So... We are supposed to be about our father's business, having the will of God to do the work. It says in Philippians 2.5, that let that mind of Christ be in you. Let that mind be in you. That desire for a soul. I moved into territory that I've never moved into before. But you remember I talk about fear and some of the excuses. Is this on? Well, I'm going to say it nicely because I may be speaking to the world at this point. So whereas in times gone by, I try to refrain a lot from speaking about the word of God in the classroom setting, I find a strategy of introducing the word of God even in the classroom sometimes when it is when I can, you know, put it in. You see, I don't know about you, brethren, but I'm up in age. The limiting factors that were there, I have to push them aside. I have to suffer a little bit more. And so I know that some of the things I will be crossing, the barriers that are set in the workplace, if I can do it, even a little, I'm going to try to get it done. We don't have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of time. I'm up in age. You see, it It probably is obvious to most persons. So I have to be pushing a little bit harder to help to ensure that I play my part. 
I play my part. Glory be unto God, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercies. So one of it is that we do not have the burden that we should. But another part of it has to do with disobedience. Disobedience? God's people living in the church being disobedient? Not saying, brethren, that we do it willingly. But we do engage in some form of disobedience. If the Lord commands us to do something, we should do it. And make all effort to do it well. Can someone find Colossians 3 verses 22 to 23 for me? Can you just read? Colossians 3. Whatever we do, do it heartedly as unto God. Not unto man, not unto God, not unto, not to please men. So we are supposed to be doing the work of God. And when we neglect to do it, then it is disobedience. So I know the workplace work is coming upon us. And I'm going to tell you something, it's not going to get easier. For almost all organization. They are in business to make money. They have for public businesses an obligation to those who invest in the company to make money for them. If they don't make money, all of those persons who invest in the company, who have stocks and so on, shareholders, they're going to lose them. So the idea is to have a limiting number of persons to carry out the task. And when they want to increase their profit, they don't increase the staff, but to keep the staff and to distribute more of the workload over those persons. It's not going to get any easier. So it is for us to know that once we are on the job from eight to five, we have to pull out and find God and do his work. We are obligated to give our work. That is what we, how we pay our rent. I'm not saying that you should neglect your responsibilities at the workplace. But I'm just saying to be prudent on how it is carried out. <clears throat> so we have to do the Lord's business. Do, it as, do our work as we are doing it at, unto God. The Lord values obedience over sacrifice. He wants us to not to do the things that are ritual, but to obey his word, take his commission seriously. We have to obey the will of God. You know, we sing a song. We go into the enemy's camp. And we're going to take back what he has stolen from us and taken from us. What are we going to take? from the enemy's camp. Are we going to take land that we lost? Hmm? Clothes? A car that we lost? What are we going to the enemy's camp to, to take? The only thing that we can actually take from the enemy's camp is soul. That's the truth. The other things you can pray about and ask God to intervene. But when you go to the enemy's camp, it's for a lost soul. That soul that you gave an invitation to, with the, that person intended to come, but he didn't come. So you're going to revisit that place. Huh? All of the work that you have been doing in a community, and you didn't see the fruit of your labor because the evil one robbed you. You're going back to the camp. 
We're going to take what belongs to you because it is Christ and you work with Christ. Holy God. That's the work that we're supposed to be doing. That's what we are supposed to be doing when we go to the enemy's camp and daily when we work. It's all over us saints. It's at the workplace that we need to evangelize at our home in our community. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, God. God, give us the will, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, to have thy will in our lives. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, the time dry now, Lord, let us do thy work. So when God, when Jesus Christ was doing all of this, and the multitude was following him, and he had compassion on them. He did say to the disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. He wants for us, we who are in the church, to play our roles more, take on a little bit more. If you cannot go out, as I mentioned, use other ways of reaching out to God. For seniors, you probably cannot walk around for a long period of time. But you can do your work right there in your community. Let us pray for the harvest, to the Lord of the harvest that he will put upon my heart that burden that I will do even more. God is looking for persons who will care for the work. It says in Psalm 26, verse 6, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing and bringing his sheaves with him. That's what we are supposed to be engaging in. Sometimes when you go out, you don't get anything. Sometimes you go out and you come back empty, and many times that is what may be happening. Sometimes when I go to the communities, uh, the only thing I get are children. <laughs> it's kind of difficult. <laughs> but I look at it and say, God, I give you thanks. The children that I give unto me first and foremost, the parents, they mean a lot to them. It's their children, their precious ones. <laughs> there was a time when they didn't want to send them out with anyone. <laughs> But they have developed trust and they are sending them out. The very young ones too. Besides, these children are the Lord's. He loves them dearly. And we should take all opportunity to plant the best seed and prepare that ground. It's so difficult because even in these communities, when the child reaches a certain age, then you can see that they do not want to come out anymore. Sometimes even their own family members encourage them not to go any further, not to give their life to Christ. I was speaking with one who usually come out encouraging that young girl to continue. And a family member came up in the community, one who seemed to be very well respected, fairly knowledgeable and all. And he heard me and he joined in the conversation. But what he was saying was to tell a young girl, you don't have to let anyone pressure you to go to church or to do anything. You don't have to go to church. Right there. He didn't even wait until I left the place. He was doing it right there in my presence. To tell a young girl that don't make anyone pressure you to do what you don't want to do. When they reach a certain age, I remember some time ago, it may have been youth week and children were coming out. And there was a little lad beside me, he must have been like about six years old, and he was quite enthused about the message. And he was going to the friends and he was putting his hand on his head and praying for them, much the annoyance of others. And by the second week or the third week, he says to me, I want to be baptized. I say, ask your parents. I asked the others, and their one was unsure, but their one, there was one who was adamant to know. 
And then it came to probably the fourth day, and I was there still encouraging those children. And I saw the relative that, that, of, of that one who said no. And I approached the young lad, probably was about 11 years old, 12 years ago. And he was like in fear. He resisted me. He started crying. He said, no, I said, I'm not ready. I have to live my life first. But it's as if I was placing him in prison. That is how he view giving his life to Christ. It's a reflection of our society and some people in our community. They have to live their life for Christ. And afterward, and they go and put themselves in a dungeon, in a prison for God. It's quite the reverse. The devil has given them, saying them a lie that they believe. We have to try to see how we can get to them. And so I'm pressing on. And I know that many of you are in your own way to reach out to these young lads and people in the community, when those who are coming out, and I see now that they have stopped. And it hurts. It hurts when I know that even that little one was coming out with me some time ago, and now he's 21, and he's backward. Christ of mercy. So we are seeking laborers. And then you may be working. But I'm going to just ask you, let us work more assiduously. Hmm? At that same one. So even if it's a one person you know, but he has not given his life to Christ as yet. Or she has not given her life to Christ as yet. Let us bombard her with the word of God. Let it be a nuisance. Let the spirit of God lead you. But to go back to that person. It is easy to assume someone at your church will do mission. The truth is, we should all be doing the laboring in the field. The reality is, living is disobedient to God's mission is not right. Living in, obedi in obedience requires intentionality. We have to make up our minds. We have to say that we are going to, we have to fix our time. To get it done. The goal of every organization to grow. The goal of families is grow, to buy a house, give children better education than I have. That's the goal. The goal of the individual is to grow, win more sporting medals, achieve more academically. Growth. We are looking for growth. Growth in our secular lives. How much more our Father wants growth in the kingdom for us to flourish for us to have eternal life, more people to have eternal life. Virgin, I put it to you. We are behind in the game, very seriously. We are behind in the game of winning people. We cannot best to start now to do catch up. It's very, very serious what is happening. Not in Jamaica alone, all over. The alcoholic industry is progressing in winning more drinkers. They want a bigger piece of the pie of this population. They want more. They're not satisfied with what they have. They need more. Even professional ladies are now drinking what, what would consider a man drink. Huh? Alcoholic drink. The participant in carnival is advancing to the point where Quietly, even the secular, those who are in the secular world are complaining now about the negative effects that they are having. Huh? They can't get to drive around and this place, a block and so forth. The garbage that is on the road and so forth. Hmm? But their experience growth. The recruits of gang members is so successful that we have a plethora of gangs all over the country. One time it wasn't so. Kingston and Spanish Town, there about, those were the place where you have gangs. Now we talk about Westmoreland, Hanover, quite a little Hanover. Huh? All over. They are making more headway than we are. Holy God. 
So we have to move aggressively to win souls. So that is what the church mandate is about. When pastor talk about we need to do work. We need to set some goals. We need to go out to the communities. When minister Ruel get out persons and move out in the community and invest in the media to have different systems in place to reach soul. That's what we're trying to do, play catch up. Trying to do our best. Please, let us all play our role in doing that part. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's just see how we can be more active. And if we don't see you in a community, then let it be that we'll see you carrying in persons. Huh? Play your part. And let me just say something. And also, we need to have some more numbers in the community because there are numbers, there is strength. When we go to the market, you know, I go to the market sometimes. When I go to the market, I notice that if there is a vendor, a st you know, a stall that has uh, like eight persons, I just see other persons gravitating to that place. It has a kind of effect, a pull factor, just more persons are there. When we go out in great numbers, then persons will say, well, go on. They'll want to be more a part of it. So come out. Numbers matter. You being there matter. You make a difference. So you might be saying, sure, all the church I go. I don't have to really go. No. Each of us help others. Don't leave it to a few members. Mission work is not for community, for the missions committee only. It's for all of us. Recently, I understand a particular pastor was on campus. I had to meet with him later in the night, so I, you know, went to see him to give him my apology that I will meet him late because I'll be finishing my class very late. He usually stay, I usually, the meeting that he has sometimes goes until very late. So I went, you know, to, to see him. When I went, he was there in the chapel speaking to the young people there. But what I looked at and admired was at about 7, 7.30 it was. And he had his little children there, about 8 or 10 years old there about. And he placed them in a corner to, do, to get their homework done. He prioritized God's business. He could have taken the children home and work with them and do the homework because he had a valid excuse. But he went to the chapel to reach some students, some people who were lost and needed help. A sacrifice he was making. And he put his children in the corner. And then after he leaves that, he rushes home. And he would be online doing some work. And if he requires, it, it, it required him to be there until late, he would be there until late. I tell you, if you, if you want him to be there at 12 o'clock at, at night, he's going to be there. Sometimes we think we are making sacrifice and we are doing well. But if we can pinch in a little bit more incrementally, it will help. The gospel has to be spread. That is what God says. The gospel has to be spread. He told it to his disciples. And we see where they branch out. Italy and India and so forth. Holy God, holy God, holy God. Help us, Lord. That we can do it. That we have this burden that God had Help us, help us. The first and the last comma command of Jesus, uh, the first is, uh, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. Matthew 4, 19 says, follow me. Sometimes I examine myself and I say, I'm not fishing. Well, I'm not, I'm not fishing, but I'm not catching fish. But you know what? If you are fishing, God will still bless you. He will still bless you. You're going to get at least one. After you reach 100, you're probably going to get at least one. It's hard, but you'll get one. 
the last command. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witness unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and also to the uttermost part of the earth. That's the last command. We have to remember that. Are there in a situation where a loved one is on the dying bed and said to you, promise me that you're going to do so and so for me. And it lingers in your mind. It never goes. Mighty God everlasting Father Jesus, help us. He ask us <laughs> to be witnesses unto him. Unto the uttermost part of the earth. Hallelujah. Holy God, holy God. Philippian ones. These are just some guiding words I'm saying as I wrap up here now. Because sometimes we read about those characters in the Bible and we want so much to be them and we just don't even know how to start. But this could be a way to start if we do not know. And for those who are on the journey already, just to encourage all of us to continue. It says, for unto us it is given in the, in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And some of these things that we are doing is that we are really suffering. It requires some of that. We are sometimes feeling some pain to carry out these. But we still have to endure. Philippians 3, 8 says, For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to do count them but dunk that I may win Christ. That you may win Christ. And what Christ is all about is hard for the lost. Hallelujah. So whatever we have, we count it to do. Sometimes we have to count it as secondary, as dunk, as not worth the while. We have to do more for Christ. Sometimes it's painful, but we have to get there. Sometimes I'm in a community. It's not unusual for me to be visiting there four times for the week. Sometimes even seven times I'm there. In COVID, it was a little bit difficult wanting to go and not wanting to go. Sometimes in that period, the Lord was still touching my heart to reach out. And phone was not enough. And sometimes I had to go. We just have to do it. And I'm craving your apologies. Your, just to, to forgive me. I crave your forgiveness sometimes. When I'm here on a Sunday morning and leave and come and go again and, uh, and I'm just in and out in the early morning hour. But sometimes I'm here and I get a call. I remember someone who I promised to pick up. And I just have to put that person and first and get out to go. And sometimes when I go, the person said, oh, I forgot that I promised you. And sometimes it's a bus that is sent, one whole bus. And sometimes none, no person. I sit there and I go and I call the pastor, not even one. And sometimes I cry and I say, God, Why? Why, if it is costing so much, God, what have I not done? <laughs> but we have to continue. Someone who has been who have been trying to for some time to get to come out to church came up to me and said, Miss, I come into church with you next week, you know. I didn't invite her at that time. And she came. 
And she said, Miss, I'm going to come out with you such and such a time. This is for many years after I've been speaking to the lady, going to the lady, talking to the lady, asking her to come. And she didn't come that much. But no, she is now taking control of the situation. She said, I'm going to come. Sometimes you will not see the fruit of your labor immediately. But yeah, sometime thereafter. Have you run the race? Have you kept the faith? These are the words that you want to hear God say. That you have run the race, that you have kept the faith. Yes. <laughs> the song says, and when my life on earth is past, there is one thing, dear Lord, I ask. Don't let me leave behind an unfinished task. That is part of my prayer. To God I give the glory. I thank you for your time. As I praise and worship God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hands and let's worship God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. So important that we are always on the job. Amen. You know, as Sister Blankson spoke, what kept ringing on me and tugging my spirit is that each of us would have to give account for the opportunities that we have had. <laughs> Each of us will have to give account for the opportunities that we have had. Amen? And you know, I believe that the Lord is preparing persons for the gospel. Amen? And we might not know when the Lord will really Bring them in. But we have a part to play. Amen? We have a part to play. And even through the situations that persons are going through, there are opportunities. Amen? Even I was just witnessing to somebody the other day and I was saying, boy, I know when it was my turning point. And I could identify that person was going through that turning point. And it was an opportunity for them, for me, to encourage them in the gospel. Amen? And so to each of us, if we are sensitive to where or how God wants to use us and where he has placed us, we can recognize that there are opportunities there. Amen? I mean, just the other day I was pumping the tire. And I saw a gentleman there. And it so happened that they had killed somebody further up the road. And I said, boy, you know, I started to engage him on that subject. But I know where I was going. <laughs> so I encouraged him to give his life unto the Lord. And that person really recognized the state of affairs this country was in, you know, and the world is in. But you know, to put it together for them. To bring that awareness of the times that we live in is so important. Amen? And so too, you have that opportunity, be it in your family, a lot of us going through situations in the communities, people want that hope. And sometimes when we use those opportunities, it becomes very seamless. Evangelism is seamless. You go into the bank, you might be standing beside somebody. If you're just sensitive to what is happening, you'd realize an opportunity. Amen? And as Sister Blankson said, sometimes you're not going to see the fulfillment of things. But you can plant that seed, you can water that seed. And eventually, we will get the increase. Amen? Amen. I want to thank Sister Blankson for that timely study. And indeed, 
I know the work she's doing. I went to the community of, you know, of Manning's Hill and just walked with her in that little community and I realized that <laughs> she's doing a mighty work there. Amen? She's doing a work and trust me, it's when you have that burden for souls that is what carries you through. I asked Sister Blankson if she grew up in the ghetto. <laughs> I asked for a reason. Because when you're walking and you're walking through the little drains and the, you know, the water coming from the neighbors and so forth, some of us wouldn't go there. But when you love souls, when you realize that time is at hand, when you realize that you have an opportunity, when you have life and strength in your body, we have to seize the opportunity. Amen? Amen? When I was praying for Stanisha's cousin, I was brain dead. And I was praying and asking God for mercy and so forth, but the window was closed. <laughs> The window was closed. And even though I was asking him to, you know, you know, repent and so forth, if you're not baptized, <laughs> so it behoves us to seek all those who are astray. It behoves us as well to press towards trying to reach them while it's still, the opportunity is still there. Amen? So let us endeavor our best to really witness to someone. And as I said, we all have the opportunity. If you are just cognizant of it, you'll realize that the opportunity is right before you. Amen? Let's lift our hands and let's worship God. Let us thank God for speaking to us today through his servant hallelujah. hallelujah we give god thanks for her we give god thanks for her ministry we thank you for the burden that she has for the souls hallelujah that takes our evening to our own resources so many times i know but god god is faithful god is just god is will ultimate reward her according to the work that she's doing and we want to encourage everyone here today that is doing a work for the Lord. Let's not come down from doing that. Let us use our time wisely and work for the master. I'm just going to invite pastor to come at this time to close us off. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. May the Lord grant us that burden for the loss so that we will see the value of human souls and do all to save as much as we can by all means. We want to thank Sister Blankston for her study tonight that stirred our hearts to reach out to the lost because that's what Jesus have us here to do. Amen? So come next week, Sunday, Mission Sunday, we are going to make a special effort to bring a guest in the house. And we are going to surpass our target of 400 souls in the house worshiping the Lord. And we plant and water, and God gave the increase. Let's stand together as we just worship the Lord and thank him for his words tonight. Thank him for what he has done. Amen. Let's just thank him. And say, Lord God, just open my eyes to the opportunity to reach some dying souls. Men are dying, souls are crying. Help me, Lord, to see the opportunities. Amen. When trouble surround people, they need a, a place to look. And this trouble sometimes is giving us the opportunity to direct people's mind to almighty God. So in the name of Jesus, may the spirit of the Lord sensitize us 
to the opportunities that abound. Oh, Lord, may we not only be about our business, but be about your business. We thank you for your words tonight. We thank you for your servant. We thank you for the work she does among, Lord, the hearts of men who are captured by sin. And, Lord, we know you will bring the increase, Lord. I pray that the burden, Lord, will be laid upon every heart as we seek, dear God, to sow and to water and to worship you so that your presence will draw all men unto you. Bless us now, we pray. Lord, bless the mission's team, O oh God, as they seek to lead us into this work that you have commissioned the church to do. Hear us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you in Jesus' name. Just greet somebody as you go. And um, next month we will be uh, Minister um, Rel for, for me, where we'll be, be going for this first night service. We're going back to Castle Lights. As there's an open door in Castle Lights for us. Amen? Amen. So let's um, prepare our hearts for that. Amen? God bless you. We come out tomorrow and support the men and youths for the sports night. We'll be commissioning the table tennis board um, into action. So you all come on out and be blessed in Jesus' name.